the title is uh, Design for Transparency. And um, the background is that I'm a graphic designer by, by training, uh, but the way the aspect ratio is wrong, is it possible to fix it? If not, then we'll go with this, but it, it shouldn't be so wide as it, as it is. But anyway, um, so I'm a graphic designer by background, and quite often when I meet people and they ask what you do, and I, well, I'm a graphic designer, the most common answer I get to that is, oh, I could never be a graphic designer because I can't draw. Well, my reply is, well, neither can I. And uh, the thing is that graphic design is not about drawing. Graphic design is about co uh, communication design. So designing how to most effectively convey information or uh, not always information. Lots, lots of graphic design is not about conveying information, it's about conveying feelings, emotions, um, brand values, things like that. That is not what I'm going to talk about. Today I'm going to talk about uh, specifically uh, how graphic design can work to convey information and uh, uh, how that can be uh, beneficial for uh, democracy but also for business. So let's start with this longish quote from Hal Varian, who is the chief economist at Google. Uh, the text is long, but the point is that uh, uh, free data is all around us. We have uh, amazing amounts of information all around us in the society. Humanity doubles its data every year. It means every two years we produce more data than the humankind has produced up to that point before those two years. And this happens every two years. The amount of data around us is amazing. So there is no lack of information. The question is, how can we understand that information? The scarce factor, so to say, uh, is, is uh, to extract, extract meaning and value from that huge amount of information all around us. And that is going to be a really important skill, even for uh, school children, as Halvarian says here. But uh, at this point, it's more uh, what we designers do. My sort of mission is to make myself redundant. So I hope when I retire, there is no need for a separate uh, class of information designer, uh, but that's something that you know, uh, goes through uh, all professional fields. So you know, lawyers, engineers, uh, scientists, everybody can do information graphics. At the point, it's not so, but hopefully in, in 40 years it is. Let's see what happens. Here's a graphic from The Economist that has plotted um, um, the amount of open data uh, available uh, provided by different governments with different metrics. We have the GDP per capita, so the wealth there, then human development index, which also takes uh, issues like health and quality of life into account, and then corruption uh, on the right-hand side. And we can, this, this type of a chart is called a, um, a scatter plot, and uh, the idea is that it plots the correlation between two variables on two axes here. And um, uh, if you see clusters emerging, as you probably can see from all of these, it implies that there is a correlation between those two things. So it would uh, seem that the more open uh, data the governments give out from their <coughs> workings, uh, the wealthier the countries become, uh, the more development I developed in the human development index they become, and the less corrupt they become. What's also interesting is that, okay, I gave you an explanation about what, how to read these charts, but you probably could do it uh, without my explanation if you spend a little bit time on time it. You could see that there seems to be a correlation. Even if you couldn't give the sort of proper names for the types of charts and proper names for the types of uh, statistical phenomena that, that exist here. And uh, uh, philosopher Paul Valery has put it quite nicely. Uh, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. So when we see something, it's really intuitive for us. Uh, when we see a picture of something, we immediately know what it is. Even if we, we don't know what it is called, if we've seen it before, uh, we understand what it is. Everybody has had in their life the experience that you forget the name of uh, everyday thing. You ask your uh, friend, could you please pass me the uh, thing on the table in front of you? It just can't. Uh, remember what it's called, but you definitely know what it is. The opposite never happens, you know. Could you bring me a carton of milk? I don't know what it looks like, but uh, I, I really think I need some milk. That, that doesn't happen. So uh, vision is our most primary sense. Uh, sight transmits amount of, uh, this is from a <coughs> study in the 80s where they tried to estimate how much information different senses 
uh, transmit from the outer world to our brain. And uh, it was estimated in this study that sight produces 10 million bits per second of information to our brain. And hearing is only 100,000 bits per second, so only 1% uh, of the amount of, uh, transmitted by sight. Uh, the number, exact numbers are all, of course debatable, but I think the ballpark here is right. And um, a big part of our brain is hardwired for vision. Uh, from different contexts, I've, I've heard different numbers, I don't know if they know this for sure, but the estimates I've heard is, is uh, from 25% to 50% of our brain is used for processing vision. So it's actually uh, the biggest sort of sin single task what our brain does is processing visual information. So uh, from this point of view, you can easily see why uh, visualizations and infographics are an excellent way of communicating information, because we are sort of built for it. That, that sort of exists in us. John Tukey, who's a pioneer in explanatory, uh, or exploratory, sorry, exploratory graphics, um, has put it quite nicely that a good pictorial display of data forces us to notice something that we never expected to see. So a good visualization can tell us something about the world that we sort of di didn't even dare or, or know to expect or, or guess. So uh, two examples here. The chart on the left uh, shows um, European imports from China and Chinese CO2 emissions. So you can see they rise in tandem, which would uh, sort of imply that uh, maybe the reductions in emissions in Europe might partially only be the result of us exporting our emissions to China. So they are not necessarily real reductions in that sense. Another uh, powerful example on the right side is, uh, in, at least in Finland, there has been recently um, a really stupid <laughs> uh, vaccination controversy, like um, parents who say that vaccinations are bad for children because they uh, cause autism, for example. Well, that's quite definitely proved that they don't, but, but this disinformation is still spread. Um, but the other side of the coin anyway is that a vaccine saves lives. And there's a very powerful graphic from a New, a New England Journal of Medicine from a vaccination program in Mexico uh, that cut the amount of uh, deaths from diarrhea in the 11-month-old uh, age group of children quite dramatically. So you can easily see when the vaccination started, after that the diarrhea deaths <coughs> dropped. Uh, uh, so a good pictorial representation of data does just that. It sort of explains something about the world that you didn't know before or maybe confirms something you suspected but, but you know didn't have the sort of data to back it. But on the other hand, um, especially on the, if you look at the left-hand graphic here, it might be a coincidence that the lines uh, coincide, uh, that they go sort of in the same direction because um, there might be uh, what, what are known as uh, cofounding factors behind it. So it's easy to find, you know, two um, uh, trends that go to the same direction. Whether there is a correlation or not, you can, it's debatable. If you use Internet Explorer, you can understand that, you know, when people use less of it, maybe they come, become less murderous, but I still think that this is probably a coincidence. <laughs> So um, graphics are really powerful. We remember the picture long after we've forgotten the explanation. And for that reason, uh, I, I think uh, the sort of moral responsibility of the, of the person who makes visualization is to check out the data really carefully, that it is actually true. What we're implying actually is a fact about the world. So if we're saying that uh, Europe is exporting their emissions to China, we should really be sure that that is the case and not just, you know, these uh, two lines happen to go to the same direction because you can find uh, uh, lots of these examples. Classic example in Finland at least is that um, the ice cream sales are highly correlated with deaths from drowning, which happens to be that both happens in the summer quite a lot, so that, that's the, the cor correlating factor there, but you can easily draw a chart that seems to uh, show that there's a, there's a high correlation between Okay, so um, what is um, or sort of what uses uh, information design and visualization have? 
uh, in its most sort of basic and I think in a sense most important form, it is uh, the government uh, sort of making their own actions more transparent and better understandable. This is an example uh, done by the Simplification Centre, which is a non-profit in London, UK, um, that, that does um, uh, projects that uh, aim to help public sector to make their communications more understandable. And th this is actually a project that they did on their own accord because uh, Rob Waller, who is the um, uh, founder of the, of the Simplification Centre, his wife got this uh, um, t ticket from automatic camera. So he, she was driving on a bus lane and she got this penalty notice and it's, it's a mess, you know. The, it's so, sort of uh, quite uh, uh, yeah, important to notice that <laughs> the biggest text here is do not ignore this notice. So you can exp uh, assume that a lot of these have been ignored because they felt the need to, to add it there. And, and no wonder because, you know, it's really hard to make any, any sense of what, what this even is, this document, what is important. <laughs> Uh, what are the re relation to the data to each other. So they did a redesign uh, of the same information. That's basically uh, the same information. There's a picture added of, of, the, of the car from the automatic camera, but basically all the other information is in this one. But it's just structured differently. And uh, it's quite a bit easier to understand. Okay, it's a penalty charge notice, and this is how much I should pay, and how to appeal, and, and blah, blah, blah. So, so this, I think, is, is what government should be doing quite a bit more. You know, designing, redesigning forms. You know, it, it's boring stuff, it's not very sexy, but, but uh, in many countries, for example, filing the tax returns takes up several uh, working days of people's lives every year. And if we could cut that amount to, let's say, 30 minutes, the savings on the level of the whole economy would be huge. So this is one, one thing that uh, uh, where the transparency can come from the interaction between the government and the citizens. Uh, uh, the Dutch are actually amazing in this sense. Lots of Dutch governmental organizations uh, and public sector organizations are really good at presenting their data visually. Here's one example from uh, the Algemeine Rekenkamer, sorry, I probably pronounced, pronounced it wrong, I'm a Dutch speaker, uh, which is uh, similar to the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, so they um, look at the government accounts from a sort of a non-partisan view. They sort of try to make sense how the government uses its money and audit it and, and see if there's corruption and, and waste, waste of money and so on. Here's one example from them. I think this was something to do with uh, uh, how, how different funding relating to environmental um, something is, is, is spread uh, throughout the system. But just to show that uh, governments themselves can be very active in uh, doing these graphics that make, make their uh, workings more transparent and understandable. But uh, quite often the, the work is left for, to the media. And uh, I think this uh, quote from Thomas Molen, who uh, was uh, presenting at the, at the Visualizing Knowledge Conference this, this uh, September, and I introduced him when he came on stage that Thomas Molen uh, works uh, at the uh, Svenska Dagbladet newspaper in Sweden, and he corrected me that I work in the paper for the reader. And this is the attitude that I think all journalists and all visual journalists should have. Their employer is the reader, not the paper. And uh, sometimes, uh, I, I don't know how it's in Slovenia, I know in Finland we have a quite a good situation, so the um, papers also work for the readers most of the time. But in many countries, the case is that uh, the readers have their own financial interests and uh, might be involved in some sort of uh, corrupt practices themselves and try to protect certain politicians and so on. So it's the journalist's duty for sake of democracy to uh, bring out uh, all the information that might be relevant for the readers. And here's an example uh, from Finland. This was published in Helsingin Sanomat, which is the largest newspaper in the Nordic countries. Um, it's titled, These are the people who the parliament listens to. This was a really big research project. <clears throat> and uh, the, the journalist, Thomas Peltomäki, who did this, actually the data requests he made to the Finnish parliament uh, <coughs> took so much uh, um, for example, in printing costs and, and other costs relating to the data inquiries that they actually spent 
their year's budget bu budgeted at the parliament for data inquiries for the data inquiries he made for this project. So, so the uh, biggest thing here is the research behind the graphic. The graphic is just the end result. The research is the most important part. Um, this shows which um, um, experts have been uh, heard in different parliamentary committees and how they are affiliated with different organizations. So the blue ones are industry and employee, uh, employers. The green ones are um, uh, lobbies for the, the farm industry or the, or the farmers and, uh, and uh, uh, such uh, groups. And then the pink ones are the uh, labor unions and then the gray is everybody else. So you can quite easily see that um, industry and employers are the ones that get, get the biggest share of the hearing and followed by the labor unions and, and the, the farm lobby and others like, for example, human rights and uh, environmental organizations are very rarely consulted in these committees. Um, this graphics has its flaws. I don't think it's a perfect graphic and if, if we were doing a, uh, you know, a workshop around this graphic, I could point out many problems with the design. But uh, the research is superb and another thing is that when this was published, it obviously caused a huge uh, impact because um, this really draws you to the paper. When you see something like this in the newspaper, you're like, wow, what is this? I want to learn more about this. So this really got uh, the issue uh, on the agenda for, for quite a while. Here's another interesting project. New York Times is, is amazing when it comes to data visualization. This is a project that was uh, awarded the um, uh, main prize at last year's Malofier Award, which is the Pulitzer Prize for Information Graphics. And this is about the detainees in Guantanamo Bay. And uh, they are split there by nationality. And each box is one detainee. And, and this is interactive visualization. So you can uh, run on the timeline and animate it actually also. And you can see, so on the left side are the ones that uh, have been detained. And on the right side, those who have been released. And then there are those who have died in custody. <laughs> And, and so forth. And this is all information that was in the public already, but it was in a very sort of opaque uh, uh, Department of Defense uh, documents. Lots of legalese, bureaucratic language, every single case was in its own document and so on. So they did a huge amount of research and put it, this into context that uh, makes it really easy to see where did the detainees come, come from, uh, when they were released, how many of them died in custody, which was actually a, quite a shocking number when you go to the end of the timeline and so on. And there was also a printed version, it, which was also quite imaginary in its use of the printed format. So you don't need, even need to have the interaction, although it helps, but it can also work in the printed form. <coughs> then, of course, we have the academia who can help uh, uh, make the uh, government more transparent. And uh, one of the pioneers in this sense, I, I think maybe the uh, most important person, single person to advocate uh, transparency of data by visualize, visualizing it is, is Professor Hans Rosling of the Karolinska Medical University in Stockholm, uh, which is the university that hands out the uh, <coughs> Nobel Prize in Medicine. He's a professor of global health there, and uh, he's uh, done lots of TED Talks. His most uh, watch one, the first one of them has uh, more than 4 million views, so, so they are really popular. He's an amazing presenter. I highly recommend you check the video. Uh, we don't have the time now to check it, but, uh, but uh, a lot, basically all of his videos are good. But the good news of the decade video is, is one of the most concise uh, accounts of, of the state of uh, developing countries at the moment that I've seen. And it's, it's only like 15 minutes. Um, Hans Rosling and uh, his son Ola Rosling uh, have developed this uh, software called Gapminder. You can check it out at gapminder.org. Uh, they have uh, combined lots of different data sources from the World Bank, United Nations and other sources. And uh, it's an exploration tool where you can uh, put, uh, if you want to look at different variables, how they correlate, you can uh, choose out of 500 different variables uh, on the top, uh, on the horizontal and vertical axis, um, the variables and then the bubble size can denote a third variable and you can just pick certain countries and you can see the time 
uh, aspect of it and so on. It's, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, Google bought the technology and, and it also now exists as two different Google products. One of them is uh, Google Public Data Explorer, which is basically the same as this. It just looks a bit more like Google, but it's more or less the same product. And then what's interesting, they have also created a product called Motion Chart, uh, which is basically just uh, bare bones where you can add your own data. And this has been also quite important uh, development. And uh, Google Motion Chart has been used uh, for other projects like this. For example, here's an example from Finland. Uh, so this is a project where uh, a group of, uh, of um, programmers just took uh, Finnish data from, uh, from Sotkanet, which is uh, it's a government-operated uh, data repository for uh, health-related data and they created using the Google Motion Chart technology their own visualization. And I think that is even more important than giving a good access to the World Bank's and UN's data is that now the tool is available for anyone who has data sets that they want to make explorable. Uh, startups and NGOs obviously play a role too. This example is from Nigeria, a startup called uh, Budgeit. Uh, creates uh, simple infographics about different uh, typically financial topics. This is about the oil industry in Nigeria and they have lots about government spending and, and so on. Uh, once again, uh, I, I find lots of problems with this particular graphic. I'm not showing it because I think it's, it's an excellent infographic. Uh, the reason why I'm showing it is uh, that um, in a country like Nigeria, where the government is very opaque, they, they have no sort of drive to push their own transparency very actively. Uh, there, in countries like that, you can have organizations like budget that actually uh, make a profitable business about uh, uh, transparency, you know, creating tr uh, transparent visualizations, explaining what the government is doing has actual uh, uh, sort of commercial potential because the people who live in the country want to know what their government is doing and if the government isn't providing that information then the media is and in this case budget provides their services to different Nigerian newspapers and other publications and, and uh, sort of affords their living by doing that. Here's an example from Mexico, this is uh, called Procampo, the organization it is a, a non-profit organization that uh, I, I think that Mexico's uh, financial system is one of the, uh, or the, the um, government accounts, so I've heard, is one of the most opaque in the world. So, so they do different visualizations and research projects on, to make that data more understandable. Um, this is uh, about the budget, the federal budget, how the different um, fields are allocated money within that budget. And one more example, uh, from, from uh, um, the sorry, companies. So this is an uh, Irish company called uh, Legal Panda that did uh, as simply to promote their own company. The, the, they are not connected to the budget anyway. It's a legal company. But just you know, to get name recognition when they started the company, they, this is infographic uh, of how the Irish uh, government budget works, what goes into it. Once again, not a very good graphic in my opinion, but this has, at the moment, the last I checked it, it had more than 100,000 shares and likes on Facebook. Um, so there's a huge demand for making uh, financial data from governments accessible. And it can be used as a marketing tool also. So not, you don't have to be an NGO, a do-gooder. Uh, to work in this transparency visualization field. It can be a part of your own marketing. That's amazing, I think. <laughs> uh, here's a startup from Finland called Hahmoto, who, who has this product called Veropu Tax Tree, which is a tool that visualizes budgets so that on the left side you have where the money comes from and on the right side where, where it goes to. It's a hierarchical layout and then you can um, zoom into the branches and see, see in further detail on, on what uh, the money is spent in each of the branches of the government. And, and lots of local governments, for example, use the company's services to visualize their own budgets. <coughs> Here's an example from the United States, which I don't think is, is very good. Uh, 
it is quite complicated. It shows that, of course, the federal budget is complicated. Uh, but once again, this has uh, got an amazing amount of shares uh, in social media. So the topic is interesting, but the visualization in itself isn't very good in my opinion. Well, I've been talking about a little bit about how some of these visualizations I've shown are, are not necessarily excellent. What then uh, makes a good visualization? I just think that this quote from Ben Schneiderman, who is one of the pioneers of computer-generated visualizations, uh, is, is very uh, sort of, I, I use this as a motto for my work. The purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. So we don't do visualizations to create pictures. We do visualizations to create insight, and uh, that also means that sometimes visualization is not the best tool. Sometimes a better insight is given by a text, a graphic, a photograph, or something else. But quite often it's, it's the visualization. But when you keep this in mind, that you are in the business of uh, creating insight and not pictures, that's sort of where the, the uh, magic happens and the good visualizations come out. Here's an example <clears throat> from a Finnish news weekly called Suomen Kuvalehti. This was uh, about a year ago. We had a municipal election coming up and, and different voters were uh, asked about their voting preferences, uh, which part are they going to vote for and uh, for what reason. And the different reasons, the, on the top there is healthcare and uh, on the bottom we have the big municipal reorganization program that is going on. And different questions here. The different uh, tabs there represent different parties and they only show the most extreme ones. So we have eight major, uh, eight parties in the parliament at the moment, so they only show one, 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 uh, two or three parties and the others sort of would, would lie in between them. If you look at the graphic, you uh, might notice that actually on the left hand side, for example, on the top one, the top uh, uh, graphic there, uh, the leftmost value is 3.25 and here it's 2.49. So they're not using the same scale at all. Uh, I did redesigned this graphic simply to show that <laughs> what the actual, uh, sort of they use the same scale, so you can actually make some comparisons between the graphics. And uh, what emerges, it, the picture that emerges from there is quite different from here, because actually there is no information in the graphic here. Everything is in the text. The graphic brings nothing more to the table, because there is no possibility to compare anything to anything. <laughs> and on the right hand side you can make that comparison. And as Vesa Kuusela, who is a sort of a grand old man of uh, Finnish statistical graphics, has put it quite nicely, comparison makes the chart <laughs> meaningful. So unless you can compare something in the graphic, it's not really an information graphic. It's just, you know, at best it's an illustration, at worst it's a waste of space. Okay, another thing is reduction. So, Here's a screenshot from Google Earth from downtown Helsinki. On the left hand side we have the satellite image or aerial image, in fact, with uh, street names overlaid on it. And on the right hand side we have the map. So this picture actually has all the information that that one has and lots more. We can see, for example, the materials that the roofs are made out of. And we can see individual trees and so on. But I would imagine that when most of you, when you came to Helsinki, you would probably prefer to navigate using that map to, than to, to this map. Because a uh, lot of this information, the extra information here, is just unnecessary. If you are trying to get your way from, uh, let's say, to the central railway station, to uh, Aalto University business campus, where the visualizing knowledge uh, conference is held, which is about here, uh, you probably are not interested in what materials the roofs are, are on your way, way there. So by leaving out that superfluous data, what we leave in uh, gets more visual prominence and because of that becomes uh, more understandable. So reducing the data is actually a very important part of doing a visualization. But when you're talking about uh, <coughs> uh, reduction, it also uh, works with uh, user interfaces. Uh, but uh, when we're talking about transparency, of course the reduction uh, can't be that we cherry pick the data to fit our proposition. That's not transparency, that's propaganda. Um, here's an example from a Ukrainian uh, organization called Texti. 
that uh, does independent election monitoring and uh, visualizations relating to that. And here's a graphic that visualizes the 2012 uh, parliamentary election results on a map where you can easily see the, the uh, amazing divide into two of the country. So basically on the, on the western side, uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm not an expert in Ukrainian politics, but anyway, the so-called Orange Party uh, was really dominant on the western side, and on the eastern side it was the Ukraine, Ukraine of Regions Party. And, and the divide is quite, quite amazing when you look at the map. So what has been reduced here is everything else but the data. You don't reduce the election results if you want to be transparent about them, that you would pick something that you think are relevant. You put everything in. But what you leave out is you don't have any rivers there or, or railroads or anything like that because it's not relevant to the task at hand. So reduction doesn't mean uh, that less is automatically more. You have to be uh, careful about what you leave out. You leave out the thing that is not necessary, but what is necessary you keep and put more of it and more of it preferably. Um, visual reduction also, uh, or um, uh, this sort of structural reduction also doesn't mean that you have to be minimalistic. Um, uh, here's an example from Fortune magazine uh, in the 40s, and uh, uh, from uh, Richard Yves Harrison, who was a fantastic cartographer, a map of Venezuela that's uh, colored with watercolors, and uh, you have these nice little leaves there on top, and it's hand-lettered and so on. This is not minimalistic. This is not like vector graphics and uh, Helvetica. It's, it's uh, quite subtle and, and quite beautiful, but it's uh, content-wise, it's also minimized. It, you know, you could have lots of more information. You could have the depth of the sea, for example, but that has not been considered relevant here. Another point which is interesting that usually we are uh, used to seeing maps not up, and it's good to have some standards, but it's also good to know when to break them. And uh, in this case, the cartographer has thought about the readers who are mostly American businessmen, military men, political leaders, and so on. And what are they interested in is probably like, well, if I would start to import sugar from Venezuela, where are the ports? How far from inland does the sugar need to be uh, brought to the ports and so on? How can I get to the United States? So we sort of look at the country uh, from United States. This is sort of the relevant view for us. We see what are the obstacles, for example, the mountains there on the coast that are an uh, obstacle in the terrain. It sort of emphasizes different things than when uh, a map where north is top. So if you want to emphasize something else than, than uh, some uh, something that people already know, then turning the map upside down might be a good way to do that. Um, there's an example of <coughs> Isotype, which was a really interesting organization, uh, most active in the, in the 30s. Uh, it was founded by the uh, Austrian philosopher Otto Neurath, and at its largest it was a team of more than 20 people. Uh, they are sort of the forefathers of modern infographics. Um, their idea was to educate uh, workers who, whose functional literacy was often low and uh, who were also quite busy at the time. They didn't have much spare time. So they, for example, had a museum without any premises. They had exhibitions that were in shop windows. So when the workers returned home from, uh, from their work shifts, they could sp uh, spend two minutes looking at a poster like this and learn something about the world. And this is about the size of the armies at the end of World War I. And the graphic actually contains all the information. It, it needs very little explanation. Only that one uh, soldier means one million soldiers. Uh, one in the graphic is, is one million real soldiers. That's basically the only text you need to understand this. Uh, other than that, you can see, OK, these guys are wearing British uniforms, so they must be the allies. Those guys are wearing German uniforms, so they must be the central powers. They are marching to opposite directions. So, you know, if they were facing each other, it was, would be probably during the war. But this is at the end of the war, when they're going back home. Uh, you can see easily uh, how many died, how many were wounded. You can see the absolute numbers and also the relative numbers, because they are organized so that there's always ten uh, little soldiers in a row. So you can see that the Allied losses were bigger in absolute and relative terms. Mari Neurath, who was Otto Neurath's uh, wife later on, uh, and one of the principal so-called transformers in the isotype group, has uh, 
uh, with Robin Kindros written this interesting book, The Transformer, I highly recommend it. It's like 70 pages or something, so a, a quick read. Um, the transformer is what we would call a designer, but they didn't want to use the word design because they associated it like many people do, like making things beautiful and, you know, making decorations and stuff like that. So they have their own word, which is transformer. But the designer, as we've been talking today here, is what was for them the transformer, their transformator in German. Uh, uh, Mari Narat in the book puts it quite nicely that the transformer is uh, the trustee of the public. So what Thomas Mullen said earlier on, he works uh, in the paper for the reader. This was the idea with Isotype already in the 30s. So, so the designer uh, acts as a mediator between uh, the public and the experts, because the experts are like, ah, oh, it's complicated, you can't really do a simple graphic out of it, you have to read the thesis. And uh, the designer's role is to say, well, <laughs> sure, but you can do a summary, and then you can go in depth and sort of work there in the, in the interface between the two. So I would like to stop with, uh, or, or end with this quote from Nigel Holmes, who is a uh, pioneer in information graphics. He has put it very nicely uh, that if the artist doesn't fully comprehend the information to be presented, it's a, bet, a good bet most readers want either. So when you're doing an information graphic or visualization, the first thing you do is you first learn yourself the topic. Only after you understand it yourself, you can do a visualization that really explains it to somebody else. If you don't bother to do that, if you're just, yeah, yeah, send me the screenshot from Excel, I'll draw on top of it, <laughs> it's not gonna work. That's not how it works. And this is like where I would like, love to raise the bar for designers. So, you know, uh, when you, if you work for a newspaper, you're a journalist. You're part of the journalistic team. If you work at the company, you should uh, take part in, in uh, well, not necessarily engineering decisions as such, but you should be aware of the engineering processes that relate to the products that you're designing, and so on, and so on. And this is a really important point, so, you know, take it to your own hands. Thanks. <laughs>